Good day, this is meteorologist DT from weatherrisk.com, uh, uh, the Colonel of Confusion, your Captain of Catastrophe, the Commander of Chaos. We're here to talk about East Coast hurricane patterns. I don't want to get this video out. Uh, this was originally a PowerPoint presentation, which I've updated from time to time over the years. And I wanted to get this out while we still had Hurricane Michael and Hurricane Florence fresh in our minds on the East Coast before we got into the heart of the uh, winter season and the cold season, which is rapidly developing here. But that's another video and another discussion. Let's talk about East Coast hurricane patterns or how to tell the difference between the hype and the reality. And a uh, lot to talk about in, 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 uh, in these slides here. So let me get right to it. First, we'll start off by letting you know, of course, that uh, not all East Coast hurricanes are the same. And this is kind of important. It's the thing's obvious point, but it gets lost a lot of times. Uh, the history of East Coast hurricanes show that there are three distinct types. And knowing the three types that there are, and the upper air patterns associated with each of these three types of East Coast hurricanes will get you a better understanding of what to expect, whether or not the various hurricane models or the global models, the solutions are viable, or whether or not they're bullshit. And the classic case of this is Sandy, 2012. Up until Hurricane Sandy came through in October 2012, no hurricane had ever come up the East Coast and made a sharp turn into New Jersey like that. It never happened before. So when the models were showing it, if you knew what the upper air patterns were, you could understand why the model was doing it and whether it was a viable solution. The problem when forecasting East Coast hurricanes is that way too many events are overhyped that in the end are end up being no big deal versus the too few and far in between big hit events like uh, Donna or Sandy or Hazel or what have you. So the Weather Channel, social media, TV Mets, weather weenie sites, they love to focus on the big East Coast hurricanes of the past, but they have a tendency to ignore the regular hurricane, the, the near misses, the ones which turn out to be eh, a storm, but not the end of the world. You know, not every hurricane on the East Coast is going to be the next Donna or Hazel or Floyd or Sandy. They just aren't. And you have to know the difference. Now, problems in forecasting East Coast hurricanes. The hurricane models are very good in the MDR, the main development region, the tropics. And the image on the left shows this, a classic example of it. You, know, the more, you can see the strong agreement here on the hurricane models uh, in the, uh, over in this slide. You notice how you, know, you can clearly see that all the models are taking this particular uh, storm up into, uh, you know, through the Lesser Antilles and towards the Puerto Rico. Uh, there's not a lot of discrepancy here. But once you get north of 25 to 30 latitude, the hurricane models are often not very good. And especially as you go further out in time, where you have to deal with things like, you know, deep troughs and ridges and heat, heat domes and uh, uh, all sorts of different upper air features and patterns. And you can see the, the much bigger or different spread here on the bottom right side here. But this is Isaac back in August of 2012. So uh, this, these are the th different things you have to understand. Now, uh, problems when forecasting possible East Coast hurricanes. You know, there's a lack of experience. They don't, you don't happen very often. A lack of a pattern recognition, which is why I'm doing this PowerPoint presentation. And in every case, when it comes to East Coast hurricanes, if the hurricane global models are saying ABC, but the overall pattern says XYZ, always go with the XYZ. Because what happens is that the models will begin to shift as they see the pattern. Remember, models don't determine the pattern. The patterns determine the accuracy of the models. Important point. All right. So, um, and there are three types of East Coast hurricanes. Let's get right into this now. There's the slot hurricane, which is uh, the hurricane that passes west of 65 longitude, essentially west of Bermuda. And it gets as far, e gets as far close to the you know, coast as 72 west longitude, and then turns out to sea. Classic example of this is Felix, 1995, Eduardo, 1995, Gladys, 1997, Gonzalo, 2014. Then there's the coastal hurricane, the classic East Coast hurricane. We just had one with uh, Michael, in some ways. Uh, but Bob, 1981, you may remember that one. Uh, was it 81 or 91? I think it was 1991. So let me change that. Uh, Gloria, 1985. Floyd, 1999. Bell, 1976. Some of you may remember that one. Edna and Carol, 1954. Both those were classic East Coast hurricanes. And, of course, only a few years ago, Hurricane Irene on the East Coast. And then the third type is the inland hurricane, known as the Hammer. Uh, which has a major impact on the East Coast and inland areas. And classic examples of that was Sandy 2012, Isabel 2003, 
Hazel, 1954, Hugo, 1989, Fran, 1996, Donna, 1960. So those are the three different types of hurricanes. Now, generally speaking, most East Coast hurricane tracks are determined by four variables. And this is why people and forecasters making seasonal forecasts for landfall projections are full of crap because these variables determine whether or not the hurricane is going to make landfall in the Gulf of Mexico or the East Coast. And since we don't know what these variables are going to be in January or April or May, making these seasonal forecasts about which areas of the country are likely to be hit is a waste of time. It's mostly there to, you know, click and bait and to get you interested in their products. Really, you can't do that. So the four variables that determine landfall chances, as well as uh, hurricane in, uh, influence intensity, uh, obviously, besides the warm waters in the Atlantic Ocean, are first the position of the war, the Western Atlantic Ridge, which you may know as the Bermuda High, very important. And this particular season, we saw with Florence, we saw with Michael, the Bermuda High was very far to the west, which is why we had such a warm September and first seven days of October. And that's one of the reasons why these hurricanes were forced inland. Bada boom, bada bing. Classic case of it, Florence Michael. Okay, next one is the possible trough position over the plains and or the midwest which can act as a speed uh, enhancing forward speed of the hurricane as it comes up the east coast and then there's the trough amplitude over the midwest and then there's the nao phase and usually in this case a positive nao is better for east coast land following hurricanes and again we see that with michael and with florence as the nao has been consistently positive all summer and through the first entire september and the first 10 days of october so if you draw this on a map Okay, so right here, oops, let me go back to this. Okay, or draw this on a map, you can clearly see uh, what I'm referring to. And this here is your slot hurricane. Okay, this is Bermuda over here. You can see Bermuda right there. And uh, this here is your coastal hurricane area, right in this area right here. This track right here is the coastal. Oops, let me change my marker here. So you can see this is the uh, uh, coastal area right there, right, right along the coast. And then, of course, there's the inland area, which obviously is inland, not up to the Appalachian Mountains, and pretty much not west of that, but up to the Appalachian Mountains. And this is what Michael was. Michael was this, and the coastal was, and then you have combinations, like, for, for example, Florence hit the coast of North Carolina, and then it went inland, and then swung up through the Shenandoah Valley. So there's all different possible combinations as well. But those are the three basic types of East Coast hurricanes. All right. All right, rule number one for East Coast hurricanes. All things being equal, an East Coast hurricane will try to stay along the coast of the Gulf Stream for the path of least resistance. Usually, well, actually not usually, in every case, there must be something to force a hurricane inland. Every case, no doubt about it. Sandy, something forced it inland. Donna, along the coast. Uh, Isabel, 2003, forced it inland. Hazel, 1954, forced it inland. There must be something to force in the atmosphere to force the hurricane inland otherwise it will stay on the coast and i don't give a hoot in hell what the model says i give you an example all right um well let's do this one next rule number two rules for east coast hurricanes number two the western side of the east coast hurricane when it's coming up the coast from south to north or southwest to northeast the western side will always have less wind and less rain conversely the eastern side will always have more rain and more wind this also leads to the general public, the news media, accusing the Hurricane Center, the TV meteorologist, the NWS, of hyping the event. Because if it's along the coast and you're on the western side, it falls apart. And the classic case of this was Irene up in New York City and, and, New, and Connecticut in 2012, um, uh, August 2012, and then Gloria in the Northeast, 1985. That was supposed to come inland, stayed along the coast, from Virginia up through, up through New York City, it was a bunch of nothing. Now, they got some damage on Long Island and Connecticut of Gloria, but on the western side of it, again, it fell apart. So there you go. Another classic, classic case of that. All right. Now, this is a, a schematic here of what we're talking about of a hurricane. Remember, the western side here. So let's assume we have a coast, and the coast is like this, okay? So the western side here, your big cities will be located here, you know, Richmond, D.C., Philly, Boston, New York. So the western side is here. So what's happening, you have 100 mile an hour winds, okay, and uh, or 90 mile an hour winds, the hurricane's coming up the coast this way. So you're getting your forward motion and added here. So this is the strong side, you get 100 mile an hour winds or higher. And then the weak side here, you're getting 80 or 70 mile an hour winds because the forward motion is 
uh, subtracting from the winds coming in this direction. So this is a classic example of how this happens. And the other reason is because, again, when you have the coast here like this, okay, uh, over here is you have dry land, you have dry air over Michigan, Ohio, Tennessee, Kentucky, and that's being sucked into the system. So what happens is that this dry air destroys the cloud base and the rains on the western side. So that's another feature. Okay, um, so uh, rule number three, all East Coast hurricanes, every one of them, every one of them, no exceptions, that track up the coast slowly will always rapidly weaken. And like I just said, this is because large circulation of the hurricane pulls in dry air, non-tropical air from Ohio or the Tennessee Valley, what have you, which disrupts the core. And we saw this to some degree with Michael. We saw this with Isabel 2003. We saw this with a, uh, a Floyd 1999. We saw this with Glory in 1985 and on and on and on. The western side of the hurricane collapses and the winds weaken very quickly. The rainfall can still be pretty impressive, but the western side of it falls apart. All right, rule number four. East Coast for East Coast hurricanes, all of the major hurricanes which have brought about serious destructive power to the East Coast, every one of them, every one, no exceptions to this rule, had either very fast forward speed as they raced up the East Coast. Some of these storms have gone up the East Coast at 50, 60, 70 miles an hour. Donna did it. Hazel did it, 1954. The 1938 hurricane did it. Edna, Carol, 1954. They all had fast forward speed. Or Part B to this rule, the hurricane was forced inland in a general southeast to northwest direction. Now, why does that happen? When the hurricane comes inland, okay, the strongest winds are pushed inland as well. So what happens is that uh, if we follow our coast here, so let me see, you can show the coast here. So this here is the coastal areas, right, in this, right along here. So what happens is you can see the hurricane gets pushed inland Okay, so here's the lighter winds. Now the strong winds, which usually stay out here, are now forced inland. So in the classic case of this is Sandy, 2012, Isabel, 2003, Fran, 1996, Hugo, 1989, Hazel, 54, and of course, September, 1933, and the 1938 hurricane. They all came inland, were forced inland. All right, next slide. So let's take a look at the slot hurricane. Very common. Of the three types of East Coast hurricanes, 50% of all East Coast hurricanes end up being slot hurricanes. They pass west of Bermuda, but usually no closer than 100 miles off the East Coast. The distinguishing feature about the 500 millibar pattern in the slot hurricanes is that the core or the center of the uh, Bermuda High is significantly close or east of the 60 degrees west longitude. And usually a significant or broad trough over the Midwest or the Appalachians that's moving into the East Coast, which kicks it out to sea. Let's take a look, see what I'm talking about here. This is Gladys, 1975. Now, Gladys is one of the my first hurricanes. I was in middle high school, middle school, junior, uh, junior high school, as we call it back then. And this was one of my first hurricanes. Got me very excited. I thought this was going to hit the Delaware Valley, and it did not. But it, it it was instructive in that it shows you how close it got, and then it got kicked out to sea. And the track here shows is very nice. This was the first East Coast hurricane threat since Dory in, night, in August of 71 or Agnes in June 72. Now, the upper air pattern showed the, the, the feature very nicely. So there's a Bermuda High. Let me get my marker out here. You can see that. There it is. There's uh, Gladys moving through the Bahamas. And we can see the western edge of the Atlantic Ridge and the black thick line there. See this line here? That's the western edge of the Bermuda High. And there's our upper low and our trough right here. So right. Now, look what happens next as we go forward in time here. Now, here uh, we have over a little time. Now, this was uh, September 28th, uh, 1975, and here we have September 29th and September 30th. So the trough, which was here, now moves into the Ohio Valley, Mississippi Valley. And uh, now Gladys is still fairly far to the south, but this, what this trough does is this trough begins to attack the ridge here, the western side of the Bermuda High. And the trough is still very strong on the 30th, and the, way, the ridge is getting weaker. And then as we move on out and further into time, now this is October 2nd. Now look where the trough is. We've gone from here to there. The trough is now approaching the east coast. The Bermuda High is still out there by Bermuda. So the western side of it is getting destroyed by the trough and allows the hurricane to begin to recurve early. And as a result, there's no chance for any sort of landfall. There you go. 
All right, let's take a look at Daniel, 1998. Interesting hurricane again. Same sort of track as, as, as Gladys. Look at this. Gladys, Daniel. Classic slot hurricane. Just classic. Briefly reached Category 3 in late August 1988. 1998. Very sharp turn, west-northwest, northwest, north-northeast. North, under 36 hours or 48 hours it turned completely. And again, at one point, people get very nervous, and then it turned out to see. Let's take a look at this. So here it is, August 1998. Daniel is a Category 3 hurricane that seems to be blocked by a long wave ridge with two areas of high pressure. We can see one high um, um, over the Rockies right here, and the other high, the Bermuda high here. So there's the hurricane this way, and here's our trough. So the track seems certain to slam it into Florida, Georgia, the Carolinas. So the Midwest trough is uh, rather weak, and it does not uh, seem strong enough to, to attack the ridge. So that, that's one of the reasons why the ridge is causing this concern. So let me go to the next slide here. And we can see that by August 31st, this big Aleutian low forces the western U.S. ridge to amplify very strongly. And that, in turn, begins to uh, uh, break up the uh, long wave pattern. So we can see this big, huge upper low, which appeared right here, right here. That causes this ridge to build up, and the trough begins to amplify, and that begins to attack the ridge uh, the western side of the uh, Bermuda High. And then with the path no longer blocked, now look where the high is. It's way out here. You see how far west it is? I mean, excuse me, see how far east it is? See how far east it is out here? Now it turns out to see. So if this Bermuda High was closer to the coast, Daniel would have come further in east. So that, that, that's what happened here. So interesting pattern. And then finally, you can see that by September 2nd, the intensifying ridge on the west coast allowed for a deep trough to form over the Great Lakes and eastern Canada, and that attacked the Bermuda High, which was too far to the east, and the thing turned around and it went out to sea. So there you go. All right, let's take a look at Bell. Now here with, um, uh, let's take a look at uh, Bill, not Bell, excuse me, this is Bill 2009, another classic slot hurricane. That was too far to the east, but it's an excellent case study. So here with Bill, we can clearly see uh, a Bermuda High way out there in the Atlantic Ocean. This is really far to the east. You can see it here. Okay, so here's Bill, the, the hurricane itself. And you can see this massive trough right here coming into the Midwest. And what it does is, very quickly, you can see that by August 21st, 2009, the war shifted out to 60 degrees west longitude. The trough really amplifies over the Midwest and the Great Lakes. It's a big U-shaped trough. In other words, not one of these sharp ones. Excuse me. This is the V-shaped trough here. And this is a U-shaped trough. And you can see this is a U-shaped trough here. And you can see what it clearly kicks it out to sea. Summary, so the initial position of this, of the Western Atlantic Ridge of Utah High was really far to the east. And because of this, Bill was able to gain a lot of latitude while the Midwest trough was too far to the west to capture it. So all the Midwest trough did was essentially kick it out to sea. So that's what happened. Okay, so then we go on to the summary for East Slot Hurricanes. The distinguishing feature of East Coast slot hurricanes are the West Atlantic Ridge. The Bermuda High is centered too far to the east. Usually, in these cases, it's centered up by 55 or 60 degrees west longitude. The West Atlantic Ridge often has the western flank, which extends fairly close to the southeast U.S. coast, but the western side does not reach the east coast. There's often a deep trough of 500 millibars, but this is rather broad. The trough is shaped like a U, and the shape of the trough is quite important. And the shape, of the, uh, the shape of this Midwest trough prohibits the slot hurricane from being pulled inland because it's shaped like a U, not a V. It kicks it off the coast. It does not pull it inland. And usually the Midwest trough hangs back over the Mississippi Valley. And then um, when it approaches the Appalachians, that usually kicks the hurricane east of 70 degrees west longitude. Okay, let's talk about uh, the coastal east coast hurricane track, the classic track usually within 50 miles either on the coast either so or just inland or just off the coast uh, eastern new england and uh, long island geography they obviously have an advantage in these areas because they stick out into the atlantic ocean classic case of the classic east coast hurricane gloria 1985 many of you remember that that was the first big super media event 
on the birth of the modern media era, in my opinion. Uh, it got a lot of media attention on the East Coast. Uh, the cable news networks were just coming online then, so that was the first big uh, super uh, weather event of, the, of, of really that uh, was so common now here in the 21st century. Then Bell 1976, Irene 2011, big, big media coverage there, Floyd 1999, Bob 1991, and Carol and Edna back in 1954. All of these classic East Coast hurricanes. Let's take a look at 1998 Bonnie. Now, Bonnie actually had some similarity to Michael, and I used that as a template for making my forecast for uh, Michael, which is why I was so bullish on the winds in Virginia when everybody else was downplaying the winds. Okay, so Bonnie was a surprise event in that it made landfall over coastal North Carolina while well, the models kept taking Bonnie off the Hatteras coast early. Hatteras had wind gust of 98 miles per hour, frying pan shoals 104, Cape Henry had a wind gust of 81 miles an hour, and um, there was a gust in um, on uh, with a gust of 104 also. Uh, the Chesapeake Bridge Tunnel had a gust of 104 miles per hour, and Norfolk had a wind gust of 80 miles per hour. In fact, Bonnie was the first time Hampton Roads reported sustained hurricane force winds on any tropical system since dawn in 1960. So that's why Bonnie, to me, was a big event. I was in the NWS at the time, and we were looking at this event. We were very surprised by how strong it was and how it held together over Hampton Roads. So interesting, interesting case study. Now, this here's the upper air pattern of Bonnie, and we can see the war. Western Atlantic Ridge, the Bermuda High, whatever term you want to use, is centered around 65 west longitude. But there's a second ridge, you can see that I've highlighted very clearly, covering most of the plains in the lower Midwest. You can see that here. And this feature right here, this is Bonnie right there. So there's a gap between these two, and that's where the hurricane's going to go. Well, okay, that makes sense. It's pretty obvious. So if we look at the upper air maps here, uh, we can see um, on August 25th that Bonnie is coming into the coast here. There's a front coming to the Midwest. And the upper air pattern shows this nicely. We can see very clearly one ridge, two ridge, there's the mute high, and there's the gap right in here. And Bonnie is going to go right into this gap. Now, this cold front's going to kick it out to sea eventually. And uh, we go to the next, let me clear this out. Our next slide shows here, this is uh, August 26th. The upper air, the surface of the upper air map, and you can clearly see the strong cold front coming southward. A nice uh, late autumn high pressure system coming here, right here. You can see the high there. There's our front, and this is Bonnie. See what it's doing is making its turn. And but you can see that the gap here is very narrow, and because the uh, western I noticed that the West Atlantic Ridge actually builds a little closer to the coast a little bit here, and that uh, gave that little push to Bonnie to the coast. And uh, I believe the next slide here, here we go. West Atlantic Ridge, you can clearly see it, uh, has built towards the coast a little bit. Notice what happens here. The cold front gets delayed a little bit. I um, mean, because the cold front was delayed, Bonnie was able to make landfall on the um, east coast of North Carolina. The models back here were too aggressive with the cold front. And given how deep or shallow the trough was here moving to the Great Lakes, the models were overly aggressive with the front and it kicked it off the coast too fast. And that delay of 24 hours is why Bonnie came inland. All right, let's talk about glory in 1985. Big, big storm, big event. All right, first major hurricane to threaten the East Coast at the dawn of the information age. Gloria's eye, the pressure was 942 when it passed 35 to 50 miles east of Hatteras. This is important because most of the models had it going over Hatteras. That did not happen. Let's take a look at the upper air maps of Gloria. Big classic, classic case. Okay, now the, there was a little event before Gloria, which some of you may remember, especially if you're a weather geek like I am, known as Tropical Storm Henri, <coughs> also known as Henry, which came up uh, up the east coast a few days before Gloria. The Western Atlantic Ridge, the Bermuda High again, was centered look where it is here now it's a little further to the west at on 75 or 80 degrees longitude so let's let me show you a comparison here there it is here okay you see the western atlantic ridge that's nice but if we go back to let's say um bonnie we can see the ridge is much further to the east so you see how important that position of the atlantic ridge is well, that's bonnie and this is gloria big difference okay now, we have a look where the trough is. Now, the trough is over the Rockies and the Plain States headed for the Midwest. So there's Henri going over the top of the ridge right before Gloria begins to approach the East Coast. Now, uh, Tropical Storm Henri along the East Coast 
uh, major trough over the plains and the Midwest. The trough, as you can see, is very U-shaped, is very deep, very amplified trough. Now, because the trough is so strong here, this became even stronger. Remember, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. So in this case, the Western Atlantic Ridge from Bermuda High got pretty strong, even when Henri went over the top of it. All right, so here we have the morning of uh, September 25th, 1985. <clears throat> you can see we have a major trough over the plains, but it slows down. And what happens is we get such a strong early polar vortex right here. Yes, in September, it can happen that the ridge amplified up into eastern Canada. See what this does? And because it did that, this slowed down and this allowed um, uh, a Gloria to swing a little closer to the coast. So the development of this polar vortex here allowed the ridge to expand, the trough pushed deeper this way, and that pushed the Bermuda High further in to the coast in this area in here. So that's one of the reasons that happened here with, with the glory. That's the driving feature here. And then here we can see on the 26th, I believe this is, uh, yeah, it was the 25th. This is the 26th. The major trough over the Midwest is moving very slowly to the east because of that huge polar vortex over Hudson's Bay, Canada. Very strong for this time of year. That encouraged or amplified the Bermuda High to build into the east coast. And as a result, glory was squeezed between the Midwest trough and the ridge. And that allowed it to come up, uh, up the coast here. Now, what happens is that the trough over the Midwest finally goes negative and it runs up against the ridge. So in other words, by negative, we're talking about the tilt becomes at a northwest southwest alignment. So this is a negatively tilted trough. You see how it's tilted this way? This is a positively tilted trough. That's positive and that's negative. So you can see because the troughs are negative, it now grabs glory and pulls it inland. And here's the ridge blocking it from going out to sea. So this allowed glory to stay essentially on a due north track. All right. Um, and because of it, uh, it was not able to go any further inland. The ridge was just not strong enough to force it inland. The trough captured it a little bit, but the ridge was still too far to the east. And as a result, glory stayed on a due north track. Now, this is Floyd, same sort of thing. Classic East Coast hurricane, Floyd 1999. Many of you remember it at one point. It was a sixth named hurricane and the fourth, uh, for, sixth named storm, for, fourth hurricane of the season, and the third major hurricane, 1999. At one point in the Bahamas, the pressure got down to 929. And at the time, it was one of the largest evacuations on the East Coast in U.S. history because they did not know where it was going to go. If you remember, they shut down Disney World and much of Florida because of the track of Floyd. They had no, there was uncertainty as to whether or not it was going to turn and hit Florida or turn before it reached the East Coast. The GFS model took Floyd into Florida. The European model turned it very sharply. And once again, the European model proved to be its superior solution. So we look at the upper air map a little bit here. We can see some important features. All right, here we have the major trough over the plains, not of the Midwest. And look where the Bermuda High is. The Western Atlantic High is out there by 60 or 65, pretty far out there, as you can see. And right here is a Floyd, and there's our trough very nicely. All right, so as we go further in time, we can see what happens here on September 13th, 1999. We uh, you can see the trough up or low developing now over the Midwest here. The ridge is fairly strong. The western flank of it goes out to the coastal areas of the Carolinas. Uh, you can see that ridge very nicely here. Let me get my marker so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. You see the ridge, see how it extends out like that, the edge of the ridge line? So this would imply a turn, and then at some point it's going to turn around. And then, of course, this feature is coming that way driving it so the gfs model like i mentioned earlier correctly consistently took floyd into florida and delayed the turn the european model showed the turn was going to happen so the trough is much stronger uh, as it comes through in here and it weakens the western side of the ridge right here and floyd begins to turn to the north and that's exactly what happened and there we go we can see it OK, <clears throat> by September 15th, the western flank of the Atlantic Ridge has completely collapsed. The trough moves in much further to the east. Uh, moving, and you can see the, the eastern side of the trough is now in New England at this point, And Florida is being pulled to the north into the trough. And then it's out to sea. The difference between Floyd here and what happened with um, Gloria 
He's at there's no uh, polar vortex. See the polar vortex of Gloria? There it is. You can see it very nicely. The upper end map on the right hand side. And if you go back to um, uh, uh, Floyd, we can see that there is no polar vortex. There you go. Okay, so summary for your East Coast hurricanes. The distinguishing features are the Western Atlantic Ridge is usually around 60 to 65 longitude. The, that's where the core is centered. The western flank of it can be up to the east coast or inland, but the core is around 60 to 65 west longitude. Like I said, the western flank will often extend the 588 decameter line out towards the east coast, the southeast, what have you. The typical big Midwest trough is usually located over the Midwest as the hurricane approaches the eastern Bahamas, around 70 longitude, 30 north latitude. And it's typically located over the Plain States, and then it moves into the Midwest. Now, because the Plains Trough is located further to the west, the western Atlantic Ridge, if even high, gets a chance to build inland a little bit. And because it builds inland, this prevents the hurricane from turning out to sea too early. That's typically what happens in the East Coast hurricane, classic hurricane pattern. Okay, finally, let's do the inland hurricane track, only which is most uncommon, 5 to 10 percent, maybe 15 percent of all East Coast hurricanes come inland. Now, nearly all of your famous East Coast hurricanes that have done a lot of the big damage that we talk about uh, were all inland hurricanes. Isabel 2003, Fran 1996, Florence 2018, Michael to some degree 2018, Hugo 1989, Hazel 1954, the 1933 Chesapeake Bay hurricane, the 1938 Long Island New England hurricane, best guess examples. Let's take a look at Isabel. Classic, very good track here. You can see it gets forced inland, obviously. Um, it reached Category 5 status twice. It was the first real tropical cyclone with hurricane force winds. They hit Richmond and Norfolk since 1954. All right, here's the map here, September 15th. You can see, look where the Bermuda High is. Not Look where it is. It's not up by 60 longitude. Look at the difference here. Look at this right here. And just to show you the difference, let me clear this map so you can see it. So that's that. Let me we'll scroll back here a little bit to find a better map. And there's Floyd. Look at the difference. Floyd, Isabel. Wow. Now, look what your trough is. Your trough is back here. Not here. Back this way. And you've got the big high like this. So what's happening is, as this trough comes inland, the high is still holding, and it's forcing the this trough amplifies, and it begins to pull the hurricane northward. So we'll see that in just one second here. Okay, so this is about 2003, <clears throat> September 15th. You can see the ridge um, over uh, the northeast uh, in the west northwest Atlantic Ocean, building into Maine and southeastern Canada. Here's their trough over the Midwest. It's beginning to push down. It's, notice again, it's negatively tilted. See that negative tilt again? So it captures, it creates a weakness in the atmosphere, and Isabel is going to move to, into the weakness. All right. They can only move to the northwest. With this Bermuda High like this, there is no way this can turn out to sea. That's not possible. Even though many hurricane models tried to say it did. I got news for you. I got the hurricane models from the 2003 from Isabel. They did not do a great job. All right. By, um, <clears throat> this is, excuse me, September 18th, 2003. We can see the Midwest trough uh, moves into the Great Lakes um, very nicely. And the ridge is actually built in, as you can see, into the Atlantic Ocean, into New England. And this movement of the ridge into the East Coast, this is exactly what we saw with Florence. Exactly what we saw with Florence. Striking, just striking. Now the new trough, look where the new trough is coming in, here. So as this trough comes in here, the ridge builds it built in that way and forced Isabel inland. And we have the devastation we have from Isabel. Very impressive looking system. Now this is by, um, I guess we got that slide. Okay, so to give you some conditions here, remind you of what happened with Isabel. This was the track, and you can see um, that it, this is a Richmond, Virginia, right in this area here. So it passed south of Richmond, fairly close to Petersburg, and up towards Charlottesville. And you can see the wind gusts very strong here, just, uh, oh, just over in eastern North Carolina. And this was the radar signature you can see of the classic East Coast hurricane track coming inland. Very powerful system moving inland. And you can see at this point here, 
on the evening of the 18th of September 2003. The core is here and this is Richmond down here at Petersburg. So you can see the strongest conditions are definitely in this area right in here. Very significant hurricane. All right, let's take a look at Hurricane Hugo, 1989. Another classic East Coast hurricane that got pulled inland. Briefly reached Category 5, moved through the Northeast Caribbean as a 4. The minimum sea level pressure in South Carolina was 931, which was the most intense East Coast hurricane since 1900, breaking Hazel record. And that, I believe, um, Michael got down to uh, 915, the other, but that was Florida, so not quite the East Coast. In any event, let's take a look at the upper air map. This is a September 20th, 1989. Again, again, look where the Bermuda High is fairly close to the coast okay now we did have an upper low here which is a little different with Hugo over the southeastern states and the uh, trough is on the west coast way out here as you can see okay so what happens is uh, the trough moves into the Rockies you can clearly see that the upper low is over the southeast and the Bermuda High again with your trough here you're going to get your West Atlantic Ridge here, and it's going to want to build inland, which is what it did. You can see it builds way inland. And that forces, with the upper low here, that forces Hugo to turn in that direction, which is exactly what it did. There you go. You can see it very nicely. Now, the trough amplifies very strongly over the Midwest. Uh, the upper low is, is uh, over the southeast, over the Delta region, and Hugo is now right about here. You can see it. that's Hugo right there on the surface map. So, and, and this trough is quite significant for September. You can see um, one cold front here, another one coming through here, pretty strong high in this area. So this is the upper trough that supports it. But as this trough went down here and amplified the ridge built in, and Hugo is forced inland. Again, it only comes inland when something forces it inland. That's true with all East Coast hurricanes. Now, this here is... Um, yeah, we did that one right. And then this here is Fran, 1996. Third category, third hurricane to hit East Coast in 1996, category three landfall, Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm sure many remember it. And in this case here, we had a big hurricane beforehand, which was Eduardo. Eduardo bypassed the East Coast, was a slot hurricane. And you can clearly see that hurricane was here. And this is Fran. Now the Bermuda High is out by 60 to 65. And there's a fairly weak trough over the Midwest, up below there over Arkansas, Mississippi, and there's a trough in the Pacific Northwest. So what happens as Fran approaches the coast? Well, the trough uh, over the east, over the west coast, begins to amplify. Now Eduardo is gone here, and this is uh, Fran. And as as Eduardo, as as Eduardo leaves, the West Atlantic Ridge builds back in, and that forces Fran to go in that. Uh, in that direction here and we'll see that in just one second so uh, the upper level um, uh, low which was um, over uh, the Mississippi Alabama that just stalls it doesn't move very much at all and you can see here that the western flank the Bermuda High builds back in you see it almost touches North Carolina and um, the upper level trough over the uh, west coast remains very strong, doesn't move inland at all. And that keeps the trough over the western land, that keeps the ridge, the west Atlantic ridge, the Bermuda High, fairly strong. So here is your trough, and there's your ridge. Trough, ridge. So again, um, and that allows it to build inland, and that forces Fran to come inland as well. And in this image, let me clear it out. Here you go. We can clearly see September 6, 1996. The trough is still over the western U.S. Now, it's a fairly deep trough, but what happens is it allows the ridge to build inland. And as a result, Fran is forced to go further to the west. And as a result, it ends up swinging up by Pittsburgh. It goes out by uh, Charleston, West Virginia, then tracks up into Pittsburgh in order to get around the ridge over the West Atlantic Ocean, very far to the west. And finally, Sandy, October 2012. We cannot forget that storm at all. A uh, very impressive event, no doubt about it. Sandy was a historic East Coast blizzard hurricane type of thing. Remember, it had huge snows in West Virginia and the mountains of Maryland and southwest Pennsylvania. And then also significant in that it came out of the Caribbean, not the western, trop not the tropical Atlantic. And there was no war. There was no classic Bermuda High. Instead, we had a weird pattern over 
uh, upper low pattern over, over the Northwest Atlantic Ocean and, and uh, Nova Scotia. So here's the upper air pattern. Now let me show you the low. Now you technically you could say this was a Bermuda, this is a ridge here, and it is. This is a ridge, but this is not a Bermuda high. This ocean low here is why this ridge is here. So this unusual ocean low trapped here south of Greenland is a pivotal part to what happens with Sandy because Sandy cannot go out to sea because of this feature is blocking it. Now the models had a lot of problems with Sandy early on. And the example of it, this is the GFS model on the left and the European model on the right. Because the GFS model handled this feature so wrong, look at the difference. Look how much stronger the European model has that slow. See the difference? This is a huge difference. Because it's like that, the European model sees that Sandy has to go inland at some point. The British the the GFS does not see that. And because this feature is weaker, Sandy can stay further out to sea. So that's why the GFS model sucked. And if you go further in time here, the, the examples of it, this was the GFS model 160 hours before Sandy went out to supposedly going out to sea. Okay? And then look at the change here. 72 um, hours and so on and so forth. And you can see the big change here. Um, 72, 7, this is uh, 72 hours here. Let me get my marker. Before landfall, this is 78, and this was 84 hours. You can see now a wide turn to New Jersey, Connecticut, then a sharper turn here, and finally a much sharper turn here. So you can clearly see the model is seeing the blocking pattern. The model is seeing the pattern, and it adjusts. And we can see uh, the European model, eight days before landfall, we can see that it was almost perfect. It consistently had it, um, uh, you know, in Connecticut, then off the East Coast, then had, I mean, it was just consistent all the way through. Okay, uh, and this is the upper air pattern here. And again, no Bermuda high, not really. So we have this huge ocean low, which everyone overlooks. Everybody overlooks the ocean low when it comes to um, a Sandy and the East Coast hurricane. They don't overlook that feature. So here's your giant polar vortex and a giant trough, and there's Sandy. And Sandy is going to get pulled inland like this eventually. It'll get pulled inland. We'll see why it does in a second. Okay, so what happens is that the ocean low blocks it. The trough goes negative. You see how the trough is going strongly negative right here? You can clearly see that very strongly negative, And that forces Sandy to go inland because the ocean low is blocking it. And there we go. And this is what happens. This is exactly what happens. It gets pushed inland because it has no other mechanism to do so. So in this case here, um, we did have a Greenland block, so it, we'd have a negative NAO, and the Midwest trough it does go negative, and we do have an ocean low. And those two things will cause Sandy to be such a historic storm. So, for in summary, um, inland track hurricanes, the distinguishing feature is that they are not common, but they do happen. The models can be damned, I don't care what they say. There must be some sort of physical feature in the atmosphere to force the East Coast hurricane. Remember rule number one. All things being equal, an East Coast hurricane will try and stay along the coast or the Gulf Stream. Beyond day five, beyond 120 hours, always be cautious. Many models showing a possible hurricane track inland ends up being a coastal track. So if one model is showing something in the atmosphere that's physically blocking an East Coast hurricane from turning out to sea or forcing inland, wait and see if the other models go that way. Usually within 24 hours, they will begin to pick up on that trend if it's real. Also remember, the West Atlantic Ridge is much further to the west, often located between 70 and 75 longitude. So that's an important feature. When the uh, possible East Coast hurricane approaches the eastern Bahamas, check the position of the, any significant troughs over 500 millibars. The further west the trough is, to the located west of the Mississippi River, and the bigger the Bermuda High, the more favorable the possible tracks inland of an East Coast hurricane could be. And because the 500 millibar trough is located further to the west, the Bermuda High can build inland. A danger sign that you really want to be worried about is when the trough is over the Rockies, the Plain States, and it lifts out into the Great Lakes. Um, that allows the Bermuda High to be pushed further inland and forces the hurricane inland dramatically. And we saw that with uh, Hurricane Florence in no uncertain terms. All right, so this is the presentation. I know it's a long one. 45 minutes, I realize that, but this is very science oriented, very technical one. It's just something a passion of mine I've always wanted to do. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, 
video. I'm sure it's not for everybody, but that's okay. Meanwhile, you can still catch me over on the Facebook page and over on my uh, operational Twitter page uh, for the Mid-Atlantic region. This is Meteorologist DT. I'll catch you soon.